Morning, um, everybody. Uh, my name is Helen O'Connor. I am a uh, principal researcher here at IIED working on climate finance. Um, I am very much looking forward to the discussion this morning. I think this discussion will hopefully build on some of the conversations people were in yesterday um, around financing locally led adaptation, but also provide us with some uh, opportunity to take some of the, the elements that we hear much of and look into more detail in particular around the issues of partnership for LLA, which I'll come back to. Perhaps what I'll do to start with is, as I say, please do introduce yourselves in the chat function. Um, I would like to, before we go into anything else, just do a quick run through of the housekeeping while we are in Zoom. So firstly, just to let you know that this meeting is being recorded. Um, so please be aware of that. Um, and if you notice any uh, untoward or inappropriate chat coming through in the chat function, please do let somebody know. Um, you can send me a message directly um, if there is any problem. Obviously we are conscious that sometimes these um, events do get sort of hijacked or Zoom jacked or whatever the correct phrase is. Um, so please do report that. Also, just ask everyone to keep themselves on mute unless they are presenting. When you go into the breakout rooms later, your, um, your microphone should automatically work so that you can contribute to those discussions. Again, if you have any problem, please do let myself know or uh, one of the IIED team. Um, we're really looking forward to the uh, conversations this morning. Uh, we will have, as I said, we will have breakout rooms, so we're really keen to get your, your interaction and your comments and questions to the panel. Um, so with no further ado, perhaps what I'll do is just give us all a headline as to why we're here today. What is the session uh, that we're looking at? And I suppose to say it very briefly, we're really interested in this question about how do we take the, the investment, the support for locally led adaptation and really scale that up. And we want to really focus today on understanding what the potential role is of partnerships in doing this. So how is it that different actors, whether it's grassroots organizations, whether it's public funders of LLA can work together to deliver LLA at scale? What examples are there already of good partnerships? Why did they work? And what is it within those that we could take for others to take forward and scale up? You'll hear from uh, colleagues from various different uh, organisations and countries reflecting on some of their experiences. And then we'll provide an opportunity to use some breakout rooms to hear from you, to talk through and hopefully identify a few practical steps which could be taken by by this community, by the LLA broader community, by different actors over the next 12 months to really try and take LLA forward. So we're really looking forward to the discussion this morning. And I'd like to thank all the speakers in advance for their time. Before I move to introduce the first set of spe speakers, um, I'd like to start with a question which we're gonna put in the chat. In the chat. And we're gonna take this as a, an approach of a chat shower which essentially means we're going to put a chat question in the chat. Sorry, repetition of the word chat there. Um, we're going to put a question in the chat. And then when I say go, I'd like everybody to type in a, a short answer to that question. What we'll do is we'll come back to some of your answers throughout the course of the morning and use it when we get to the, um, the plenary discussion as well. So I'm going to ask May to put the question in to the chat so if I can encourage everyone to have a look at the chat and then once the question goes in I will say I will give you all maybe a minute to consider your answer to the question and and then I will say go and I'd like you to press uh, return and send your answer to the question to the chat so I'm just waiting to see the chat message go in. Oh, it's there. So I got too excited actually about the question. So it's already in the chat. So if you can see the question is, what are the principles of a good partnership that could promote locally led adaptation? 
So, are you ready? Are you ready? Steady? Please enter your answer now. Fantastic. I can see lots of answers coming through. We've got some elements of trust there, collaboration, local ownership. Uh, there was something else I saw. Um, yes, equality and mutual accountability. So some really great uh, and very short, thank you very much, um, uh, answers to that question. Um, that is fantastic. We'll come back to some of these, I think, throughout the course of the morning. Um, and please do encourage you to, to take a look at some of the responses there. In the meantime, I want to do two things. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Josh Agarda from South South North, who is going to be our overall moderator for the rest of the, the session. So huge thanks to Josh. Um, he will take forward after our opening remarks from our two speakers, he will move us forward into a panel discussion. Um, so with no further ado, Please, can I firstly turn the floor to um, Killian and Nicera from SDI, who are going to give some perspectives from, from the ground as to how LLA is being, uh, is being used in practice. Um, so over to you, please, Killian and Nicera. Yes, uh, good morning. I'm, uh, I'm Kilion Nyambuga. Uh, I'm an urban and regional planner and uh, also uh, a climate uh, change uh, student working with uh, Slam Dollars International uh, uh, based in Nairobi as a program officer here in Nairobi. And I'm um, supporting the Kenyan Federation of Slam Dwellers called Mungano and Avijiji. Uh, so we'll, uh, I'm here with my colleague uh, Nisera. I I think she can introduce herself. Good morning to all of you. My name is Nisera, and uh, I am a federation leader, Mungana Wana Vijiji, Kenya, and uh, I live in the informal settlement of the slums, and uh, I'm happy to be here. And uh, Kirion Nyambuga will be doing the presentation. As we only have 10 minutes. So Kirion, just take over. Okay, uh, thank you very much once again. So I'll uh, just be taking you through some of the experiences that we have uh, that we have working uh, with the different communities, and uh, but most particularly uh, addressing the issues of climate change in uh, uh, different communities. So as had mentioned, I work with uh, Slum Dwellers International, which offers uh, technical support to the Slum Dwellers Federation called Mungano and Abijiji. And uh, the main vision is to see inclusive cities where the low-income communities have adequate access to housing and services and can live with dignity. And uh, some of the tools that uh, then we uh, use in this engagement uh, include uh, policy uh, advocacy and dialogue with uh, different partners, including the government, and also uh, uh, data that has been collected and generated by uh, uh, communities uh, and also through uh, uh, integrated uh, settlement planning. And uh, I, I, want, I wanted uh, to take us th uh, through what uh, the experiences in the informal settlement. For those who have not uh, experienced them, whatever we are dealing with, so that we are able to understand uh, our perspective. So we have uh, the informal settlements that are characterized by poor housing infrastructure uh, structures and uh, mostly uh, very dense. And uh, to some extent, we find uh, uh, a level of uh, 240 houses occupying one, just one acre or a piece of land. And one other thing is that uh, we have inadequate access to basic uh, services, uh, such as water and sanitation in those areas. And also in most cases, because of also the densities and also the demand for space in the urban setup. 
uh, they often lack uh, basic amenities such as uh, education, uh, schools, health facilities, and also recreation spaces. And uh, most of these uh, settlements are actually located uh, on uh, fragile uh, areas of the city, mostly lowland areas, uh, some uh, on the quarry, and also some along the, uh, most, mostly along the river. And uh, some of the things that we're dealing with include uh, issues of land tenure. So we're looking at how then do we address land issues in these uh, communities and also address uh, issues to do with the uh, uh, access to uh, basic services. And uh, just, just in, into perspective, these are some of uh, the photos that shows uh, some of the conditions in some of the settlements. Uh, some having even reclaimed part of the riparian uh, the, the riparian land and uh, constructed housing structures because there is high demand for land in the urban setup and we're also seeing the issue to do uh, uh, the challenge uh, the solid waste management challenge where they dump their solid waste into the river uh, into the river they are, uh, therefore affecting even the water bodies uh, in the urban setup and uh, when we talk about uh, the climate uh, impact, uh, uh, whenever it rained in most of the settlement because of uh, uh, the virtue of where they, were, they are located, we find some of them are actually, most of them are actually affected by flood. So this often cause displace, uh, displacement and uh, with communities with the low level uh, of um, uh, uh, to adapt to uh, these uh, continuous impacts of climate change, uh, in some cases, then uh, this has also resulted into a uh, disease outbreak uh, in different communities as uh, this water runs through the open drainages, uh, which are often not well maintained and uh, run into the, uh, into the houses and causing a lot of uh, 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 resulting in a disease outbreak. And uh, 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 what, what I also wanted to share now is uh, now the lesson that we've learned just with the two years having now been actively engaging on the climate change agenda. And uh, one of the things that SDI Kenya did, we facilitated mapping and profiling of over 500 climate action, uh, local climate action groups in low income areas across three counties. So that is uh, Nairobi, uh, Nakuru County, and also Kisumu. And uh, these are mostly uh, community-based organizations. There are some of them are youth groups, some of them women groups, and majority being unregistered and therefore lacking the capacity to access available climate change financing. Uh, however, uh, what we found out is that uh, these uh, local climate action groups have demonstrated the ability to mobilize uh, labor and they are also mobilized resources to contribute to climate action at the local level, as we will see in the next uh, few slides. So in this, we can see uh, a group dealing uh, on waste and right from uh, addressing the issues of uh, the, the challenge of waste by youths, uh, uh, youth groups uh, being able to collect the waste some of them uh, being able to sort the waste and also transform that waste into things, uh, into commodities that either they can use in the, their different settlements and those that also they can sell and also get income out of. It. And we also seeing uh, some intervention in uh, food production, youths are uh, appreciating and embracing technology in the food production. As we can see from one of the photos where the hydroponics has been used in the food production in one of the uh, communities, and also where they have been able to ut utilize the small space within the community, available within the community to be able to plant their veggies and also to produce their own tomatoes in their different settlements. Uh, apart from that, we can also see um, interventions uh, rehabilitation of uh, public spaces or open spaces, and uh, this being done by uh, the groups uh, themselves, and they've been able to transform the group into areas that communities can use for recreation, and uh, very beautiful places that can also be used uh, by community uh, for community meetings and so on. Lastly, I wanted also to. Uh, share a story around uh, the re uh, reclamation and re rehabilitation of the riparian self. 
So one of the groups uh, in Nairobi called Comp Green Solution, we can see their work right from the year 2018 when they started transforming this riparian reserve from uh, where there were uh, a lot of uh, solid waste along the river and also into uh, uh, with just within the river itself into uh, into uh, these beautiful uh, recreational spaces and also parks that have benefit to the community can be used by the community for recreation and also uh, uh, is an addition of carbon sink within uh, the city itself. Apart from that, we uh, we have also uh, witnessed uh, groups or co uh, local uh, groups or communities trying to imagine a different future from what is existing in their community. And we can see one of these from this uh, photo that we are presenting here, a community, a group in Kibera presenting what is existing right on the right side with uh, uh, the river uh, very polluted with a lot of pollution coming uh, from the neighboring community to uh, their desired future where they want the river to uh, be transformed to uh, uh, into a clean uh, and uh, uh, in the clean uh, ecosystem. And uh, apart from this, then we are also looking at, uh, I'm also bringing in uh, some of the lessons that also we've learned working with different communities and communities being at the center of um, facilitating uh, uh, adaptation through planning approach. And uh, one, of the thing, one of the things that we are seeing in this process is uh, communities being able to collect their own data and uh, communities being able to identify uh, their own adaptation needs using the, uh, the uh, evidence that they generate themselves and uh, using those uh, 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 using those needs, then communities are able to, with the different professionals and also the government, being able to co-design and plan and uh, prioritize projects that then are supposed to be implemented to ensure that uh, uh, the benefit is experienced at scale. And one of the things that is lacking in uh, this whole process is more on how do we then, how do we actually ensure that uh, plans and priority, uh, priority projects generated by communities are actually implemented? So that can actually be uh, filled by the uh, climate, uh, the, the adaptation fund, uh, the climate finan uh, financing that uh, 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 can flow to the local uh, communities for the implementation of those projects. And uh, just showing one of the projects that uh, uh, the federation actually, uh, the, the federation facilitated in, in Mukuru, one of the settlements in Nairobi, right from the dreaming process, that right from the data collection process, community dreaming uh, with the profession and also the county, and also being able to generate their own plan, the spatial plan that contributes to uh, adapt uh, adaptation, uh, climate adaptation at the local level. So uh, one of the, uh, as I'd mentioned, uh, what is existing is how do, how do we ensure that uh, the sustainable uh, financing for locally led uh, actions or priorities that are generated by the communities. So that will be the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Killian, um, for that. Uh, uh, Killian, and uh, to, to you, Naisera, as well, for that presentation. I think it is already emerging from the presentation that you've given uh, the, import the importance of the involvement of local groups. Uh, uh, you also talked about, you know, the issue of sustainability, so where uh, groups involved can uh, generate some income that is also uh, hugely important. But again, at the end, you talked about having communities at the center, and in terms of their involvement, you know, the issue of them being able to collect their own data and to identify their needs. So basically involving communities right from the start. And kind of to segue um, out of that and probably uh, go straight into a panel discussion, um, we are very privileged today to have with us a um, number of panelists. Uh, we've got Dr. Bimal Raj Regmi, who is a member of the National Environmental Protection and Climate Change Management Council from the government of Nepal. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bimal. 
well. We've also got uh, Esperanza Carajo from the Adaptation Consortium. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got Ian Matimba from Slam Dwellers International in Zambia and Celine de Cruz, who's a visiting scholar from the International Center for Climate Change and Development. A uh, warm welcome to all of you. Now, there are a couple of questions that uh, we would like you, uh, we would like to, to discuss together. And I would also encourage that if there are any questions emerging from, uh, from the audience during the time that we are addressing these questions, please uh, pop them in the chat. Um, we do have quite a limited time, so we do want to make the most of it. However, in the context of this, there are a couple of issues that we would like to focus on. And if you don't mind, Dr. Bimal, I will start with you as uh, the government of Nepal has endorsed the LLA principles to understand from you um, why this step was taken, this important step, step was taken by the government of Nepal and um, what three, two to three things um, would you identify that happened um, in the lead up to the adoption that that enabled it to be a success in your country? Um, maybe some thoughts from you, uh, uh, yep. quick interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, organizers. So I'm really privileged to speak on behalf of the government of Nepal. Uh, today is a festival day for Nepal. So our government uh, delegates are on leave and they are in remote villages. So apology for them, from them in terms of not really uh, virtually attending because of internet issues. So I'll just begin. So you know that Nepal is a pioneer in locally led adaptation. So the government endorsed local adaptation plan of uh, action framework in 2011 and started to implement LAPAs. So this is why the government want to really endorse LAPA, LLA principles because they are the lead. So uh, Nepal's governance structure uh, for the community-based approaches align with LLA principles. So all the eight principles uh, are aligned with uh, the community-based approaches, the decentralization, and the leadership of local institutions that uh, the government of Nepal, which has a history of uh, promoting community-led management, mostly management of forest, water resources, and natural resources. So it is already nested in the approaches uh, and the principles of LLA. The third one is uh, there are there is a stronger commitment for addressing local risks and vulnerability. So the government remain content with, with decentralizing resources capacity to promote local leadership in promoting climate change adaptation. So this is why endorsing LLA means uh, a lot and an entry point for the government of Nepal. So another is that we realize that LLA is a strong entry point for reaching the unreachables, mostly women, children, elderly, disabled, smallholders, indigenous people, ethnic groups, poor, and people living in remote areas. Our new constitution, which is uh, you know, endorsed in 2015 is favorable for LLA. It really emphasizes on core principles of devolution and decentralization, more autonomy of local governments in making right choices and decisions. So that are favorable for, you know, promoting locally led adaptation. And the final one, which, uh, which uh, the government of Nepal thinks they have to align with LLA is, uh, we really wanted to work closely with diverse government and stakeholders the intention is to exchange information knowledge. So we thought that aligning with LLA is an you know, opportunity to engage with regional uh, global stakeholders for exchange of information knowledge. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Okay, so we think there are uh, you know few success factors. Uh, so one is Nepal has taken significant steps in the implementation of local adaptation initiatives since 2011. So it is basically devolving a decision making to the lowest level and encouraging local leadership, particularly leadership of community based organizations to you know, address some of the local issues, including the risks and vulnerability caused by climate change. Second is uh, there are, has been a significant pro progress in Nepal in terms of scaling up uh, you know, the LAPAs and LLAs. So the government has envisioned scaling up in all the seven provinces 753 local governments across different tiers of government, both vertical and horizontal. And another interesting thing uh, that acted as success is the decentralized and trickle down financing to the, to the local level, mostly the legal provisions of it, ensuring 80% of the resources goes to the implementation of 
adaptation action on the ground. That is another success factor. We also use different innovative mechanism in terms of really targeting the most vulnerable. So the categorization of vulnerability uh, is one of the uh, criteria for selecting the target uh, palikas and target communities. Another one is the collaborative approach because it is a joint collaborative efforts of uh, the federal government, the provincial government, development agencies, local government, communities, community-based organization, uh, international, national, non-government organization. And another important you know, success factor is the vibrant institutional mechanism that exists in Nepal, which can really you know, absorb uh, resources and uh, trickle down financing. So these are some of the success factors. So there is a last slide. I just want to wrap up my presentation. So the three things that enable the success is, one is among the importance, one is decentralized financing, the policy provision of 80%. Second is local leadership and ownership of LAPAs and LLAs at the local level, which are driven by community forestry user groups or community-based organization and local government. And the focus on the most vulnerable through various innovative you know, instruments that uh, the government of Nepal with support from NGOs, INGOs, and development agencies. So uh, we are really pleased to really endorse LLA, and we really want to partner with uh, global communities to really promote LLAs in future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bimal. That was very comprehensive. I think it is quite impressive to see how uh, closely the LLA principles align with uh, the principles of community development, as well as the devolution approach that the government of Nepal has taken. Um, just to hear some reflections from uh, from you, Ian, uh, Slum Dwellers International in Zambia. We heard from uh, Killian earlier on around the work that's, be, that's, that's, that's uh, going on in Kenya. Uh, what examples of good practice um, are emerging from your side, from the from Zambia, for example. All right. Uh, once again, good morning to you all. My name is Ian Matimba. I work with uh, Sandwila International Zambia as a program officer. Uh, uh, I think uh, Kilian has uh, already, I think, given direction of how we work as, a, as an organization, as a CI with, uh, uh, with the communities. In Zambia, we work with Zambia Homeless and Poor People's Federation, which is a grassroots movement. and. Uh, I think uh, uh, our work actually uh, has already been incorporating most of these principles that we are talking about today. And uh, I think to be more specific, I will refer to one of our, uh, our, our local aid adaptation, uh, the climate solution that to actually incorporate these principles in a settlement called Kanyama. So it's one of the biggest informal settlements, uh, informal, uh, sorry, it's one of the biggest ones in Zambia, which also happens to be an informal settlement. So uh, in this particular community, uh, we realize that uh, there is uh, there are all, all sorts of um, so squalor conditions and uh, bad characteristics of a settlement that you can think of, lack of housing, flooding, all kind of impacts that are affecting that particular settlement. Uh, but with uh, from our end as SDA Zambia, we managed to come uh, together the communities. We do mapping with them which actually enables them to be able to understand, which is one of the principles to understand uh, all the climate impacts that are in their communities and own that data and be able to lobby using it and also be able to be able to hold uh, duty bearers accountable and also demand that uh, their priorities are taken into consideration. So uh, having the community being able to collect data and analyze the situ uh, their, their communities, what's around them, what are the issues that they want to, what kind of people are in the communities that require, that are normally not involved in, uh, in decision making, it enables uh, us to be able to, to cater for everyone, to come up with a, a framework that actually speaks to the needs of all uh, 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 committee members that are in that particular settlement. So uh, in Kanyama, we ended up doing a green space, uh, actually two green space that are locally led, uh, that are locally managed and locally owned by the community themselves. So uh, we realized that in that regard, um, through the data that we had, we sat down and came up with these uh, designs for that particular green space, which actually is now a center where we do uh, the circular economy, recycling, waste recycling, and the community actually have green livelihoods there through selling of trees and also producing, um, you know, trees as well as uh, gas that can be used for them to cook at a household level in, in, in that community. So in that regard, we have seen that uh, building the capacity of the grassroots themselves to be able to actually um, 
put uh, or, or to, to scale up their local intervention that they've been doing at the household level is also very important. In as much as we look at having predictable uh, financing, we also need to ensure that the community themselves, they are prepared and be able to actually uh, access, not just accessing the funds, but actually being utilizing it and scale up intervention. So we have been there to actually uh, be there to provide technical backstopping and build the capacity of the grassroots to be, be able to manage the facilities and scale it up as well as uh, so it was a process where the community leads the process and us we are there back there at the, uh, at, the, at, the uh, at, at the background and just providing that technical backstopping so from our end I think our experience has been that the data was very key in actually being able to bring the community together making them aware of the climate impacts that are in their communities and the community also building community ca their capacity in line with what their priorities are was also key in ensuring that we have a sustainability because the project has ended but up to now they're still ongoing they're producing a number of trees yeah. they're yeah. doing liquid fertilizer through the black soldier fly a number of innovate, innovations that are coming up and mm -hmm. the goodness with this uh, approach is that we have been able now to actually attract other people who, who normally don't support such groups uh, like the government through the Ministry yeah. of Infrastructure and Housing Development in Zambia has actually dedicated some funds to support yeah. their livelihood, those specific women and also try to scale up the SAC garden initiatives in that particular settlement to about 1,000 SAC gardens in that settlement. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, no, just a quick 30 seconds for, for you to wrap up so I can move to uh, Esperanza as well. I'm just watching time. Oh, oh, all right. Yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, a good, um, I think practices for us is being able to actually champion communities to be able to be the change that they want to and mm -hmm. also utilize their resources to leverage for more support from other external uh, funders. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much, Ian, for that. Uh, Esperanza, can I come to you uh, from the perspective of the ADA Consortium? Um, what do you see emerging as uh, good uh, examples of good practice that you might share for, uh, with us briefly? Thank you, Josh. Um, please allow me to just uh, have my video off because I'm in a remote place. And no problem at all. Please go ahead. Yes. So um, I'm going to speak about uh, the CCF mechanism, uh, or rather known as the County Climate Fund mechanism, which was developed um, in partnership with the international partners like IED, Christian Aid, um, and national government partners in Kenya. Um, KMD, Kenya Met Development, um, Council of Governors, uh, National uh, Drought Management Authority, and also implementing partners which are local NGOs like ALDEF, um, ADS, African Development Services. So the mechanism basically um, in terms of uh, good practice in LLA, um, uh, it's more of a model of uh, devolved climate finance, and uh, it it seeks to mainstream climate change um, in governments, uh, subnational governments, in planning and development. And uh, basically, um, the central pillar of the CCCF mechanism is at the at the ward level, which is the lowest administrative level in Kenya. And in this level, you find that the institution that is um, established at that structure, which is uh, locally known as the World Climate Change Planning Committee, um, it seats membership of different various community groups, including men, women, uh, people living with disabilities, um, local public uh, non-governmental NGOs, and even faith-based organizations. And uh, the principles that the CCF mechanism has been applying uh, in particular are inclusion, because at, uh, having been um, rather established in the, in the legislations at the county level, it means that uh, it provides that these various groups of uh, communities are able to sit in this, which enhances inclusion and planning and decision-making of the climate finance that is appropriated annually by the subnational government or counties. Um, and the other principle is more community-driven bottom-up planning, because uh, one thing is that the climate finance is uh, 
communicated to the to the community level uh, institution, and they are informed how much money is being allocated in their ward. So they are able to plan real time with this, and they are able also to uh, prioritize, identify, and even rank which um, uh, which interventions or which climate uh, in investments they'd like to see. Uh, so for them, they're able to really, once the investment is identified, it's able to, they're able to focus on public goods. And uh, what keeps the CCCF sustainable is that one, it's enacted uh, uh, through the legislation, the County Climate Change uh, Acts, and also the regulatory frameworks. And then we have seen these, um, the Kenyan government. Uh, the political goodwill by the Kenyan government to scale out the CCF mechanism through the national climate change funds. So we can see that uh, when there's political goodwill, it means in terms of sustainability, the counties are able to appropriate the funding to the climate funds and it's able to flow uh, to the community through the CCF mechanism that is from the National Climate Fund to the County Climate Change Fund. And then now from the County Climate Change Fund, it goes to fund the investments that have been prioritized by the community. And- um, Yeah, just 30 seconds more, please. Okay, um, uh, just to note that uh, on locally led adaptation and uh, the climate investments that are prioritized by the community, we find that based uh, uh, borrowing from uh, the pilot counties where it was first tested um, until date, rather seven years, eight years down the line after doing a study to evaluate the functionality and governance of these investments, we find there's quite good ownership of the climate investments by the community. And 80% uh, of those are still working. So it's just a proven mechanism and uh, yeah, we're happy that the government is now able to actually flow the finance from the National Climate Fund all the way to the community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Esperanza. And I do apologize for rushing you. We have a very short time. And uh, there will also be time to reflect a little bit more, especially in the breakout groups. I hope those will be uh, quite vibrant. But I didn't want to end this session without having a chance to hear from you, Celine, uh, from ICAD, uh, maybe to reflect a little, about, a little bit about, you know, good practice in LLA, uh, things that you're seeing that are contributing to success. Uh, floor is yours for the next three minutes, please. Thank you, Josh. So I'll be wearing two hats, ICAD, and I'm a founder member of Slum Dwellers International. And in the last three years, I'm not a climate expert, but I've been threading this road between development and adaptation and trying to understand what it is. And my sense is that good development actually includes adaptation and bad development creates more maladaptation and creates more headaches for the community. And therefore, as NGOs and as intervening organizations and change agents, it's our responsibility to make sure that we don't propagate this issue of creating you know, another construction program or another building program without really paying attention to what consequences that has for the environment. And the Pakistan example is a good example of that. On a quick note, I really want to talk about the example of the Urban Poor Federation in Uganda. So that is a story that actually shows the relationship between funders, national government, universities, local slum dwellers federations to actually, and urban development professionals who come together on the same platform to solve their problems. So the Gates Foundation did a very interesting thing. They gave money to each of these parties. So this is, a, this is how the finance was structured and which was very powerful. So everybody had an equal place at the table, both from the slum dweller at the community level to the national government person. And together they prioritized which projects. They had an institutional arrangement at the settlement level, which they call the settlement forum, then they had the city forum and they had a national forum for policies. But at all three levels, you had slum dwellers sitting at these boards. So the so what was most important is how the finance was structured and how the funder actually allocated 
finances to different parties and got them accountable to each other. And I think this is important because most of us kind of just think, oh, you give money to the poor and they are saints in heaven and everything is going to go well. And our own experience shows us that's not true, that all of us as human beings have our frailties and it doesn't matter whether you're the president of a country or a slum dweller, we operate in the same way when there is money and power involved. And so what are the mechanisms do funders need to keep in, in, in mind to be able to balance this accountability measures, even between NGOs and poor communities. So the three lessons from Uganda is one, that there was an organized group of urban poor communities that called themselves the Urban Poor Federation of Uganda in place. So it was easier for the funder and external agencies and government to relate to them. Similarly, it was easy for the community because they were organized to deal with this whole setup. So that investment in building communities from within is very crucial. The second point was that this relationship was institutional, institutionalized through the funding mechanism by bringing, giving everybody a piece of the pie. You got everybody to the table and you created that space for an equal relationship that allowed them to talk to each other. Otherwise, if you just gave money to national government, they were never going to bring poor communities to the table. So similarly, if you just gave money to the poor communities, they don't know how to begin to engage with the national government. So I think that was important, that strategic location of finance. And third, what was important was the lesson that we learned from what didn't work. Because once the project was closed, everything shut down. So while the communities were empowered and they were able to do all of this when the project was closed, everything was shut down. So, so there's an important lesson there. How do we not just projectify some of these things? but actually think long-term and think of how we want to uh, really bridge the vulnerability gap. And if it doesn't work for the bottom 10%, it's not going to work for the better off among the urban poor. Thank you so much, Celine, for your really, really important um, interventions. And good to see you again. I remember we were uh, together in a session, I think it was for the Gobeshna conference. Very nice to see you again and to hear you uh, once more. Um, we are, as uh, as I as I look at the time, we are galloping along in terms of time. I didn't want to take too much time away from the breakout room discussions. Um, it is now time for us to break up. We're going to be breaking up into two uh, different uh, group sessions, uh, one of which which will be moderated by uh, will be led by Helen, and the other will be led by Alpha. Um, uh, let me just pull up the questions very quickly that I want us to reflect on. We will have about twenty-five to thirty minutes uh, uh, during this time. Uh, let me just find my question. Sorry, my chat is there's quite a lot of chat going on, which is excellent. Uh, it just means that sometimes I have to Josh, scroll. We, to we can post it, Josh, for you. We'll post okay. it in the chat now. Excellent. Okay, now if you'll post it in the chat for uh, now, then that would be good. So uh, what we'd like to do is um, to focus on these two questions, but also please reflect back on what you've heard from our panelists so that this is kind of a, a seamless, continuous discussion. We will have between 25 and 30 minutes. So we'd very much like that when you get to about the 20 minute mark, you start tying your discussion together. I'm sure uh, the lead facilitators, uh, facilitators in both groups will be uh, more than able to do that because what we'd like to do is take a quick 10 minutes um, when we get back in at about 10.15 uh, or 9.15 or 11.15 where you are, but in the next 30 minutes uh, to to give a quick feedback on uh, what the discussions uh, uh, that emerge from your groups are. So the two questions are, building on the panel discussion or using your own example. So this is where we would like you as respective organizations to really bring enrich the discussion by bringing in your perspectives. What are the opportunities for partnership to deliver locally led adaptation? And who needs to do what? Who is responsible to play what role um, in, in, in uh, you know, uh, creating those partnerships, build creating those opportunities. And the second question is what partnership approaches or actions by either grassroots organizations and all donors over the next 12 months could help build more momentum pr in practically applying LLA. So we would like to be very time bound in terms of what we suggest as approaches or actions. So if you had the next year, what 
needs to be done, what approaches and actions on the part of grassroots organizations and or um, funders um, could help build more momentum in practical application of the LNA principles. So at this point, I think I'm going to hand over to Jonathan to um, split into your breakout groups. We shall, as I mentioned, we shall be coming back in the next 30 minutes exactly. So remember, try and discuss for about 20 minutes. Uh, don't let the discussion go too, too all over the place. You should start wrapping it up with the, with, the, with the sense that we will be feeding back in plenary and hopefully coming out with some concrete next steps from this. Uh, over to you, Jonathan. Hey, is anybody who's still in this um, plenary group struggling Hi. to get into a, a breakout room? Jonathan, could I go into Helen's group, please? Sorry, I was just sending out a tweet. Yeah, yeah, I'll just try and move you now. One second. Thanks. You should be able to join that now. You're oh, in that group. Join? Oh, hang on. Is you it room one? All right, lovely. Thank you. Sorry, it's popped yeah. up now. Thanks. Okay, no worries. Hi there, are you um, looking to join a room? Uh, sorry, I, I think I've missed him. Yep, thank you. Is that, is that okay now?
Hi, Kiami. Have you fallen out of a room or did you not get put in a room? Uh, yeah, I just, I left the, the meeting and then went uh, to a different place, but now I'm back. So if you could, could you sure. be able to put me to another room? Yeah, I'll stick you in a room right now. One second.
Hi, Esperanza. Have you um, fallen out of a room? Do you want me to put you back into one? Oh, yeah. There you go.
Great. Welcome back to the main session. We'll just give it a couple of minutes, um, not even minutes, a couple of seconds, actually, since we're short of time. Um, I know the breakout groups have pretty much closed. Just waiting for everybody to join back in. There's been uh, quite a big rush. I think everybody's back in. Um, Welcome back to everybody. Um, thank you for um, coming back into the main session. Uh, we are quite squeezed for time. Uh, and if the breakout session I was in um, with Helen was anything to go by, there was a lot that came out of that. And I'm pretty confident that there was um, that uh, everything that was put in the chats as well is going to be harvested and shared. Um, we don't have much time. So what I'm going to ask Helen and Alpha to to do is a bit of an exercise in alchemy uh, in three minutes to be able to distill all of that rich uh, content that was coming out of these uh, these groups. So um, I'll, I'll probably ask you, Alpha, to go first. And what I'm looking for is a quick three minute um, summation of what emerged from your uh, from your breakout group, and then followed by Helen. And what we are looking for here is some kind of pro cross pollination of ideas. We are both addressing the two questions together, but we would like to come out of this with uh, a clear idea of what the the the, the, the role that the different actors need to play, but also make it time bound uh, in terms of practically applying LLA within the next uh, 12 months and beyond, but also to look at some of the issues and procedures that uh, were discussed that could be focused on uh, that we could all learn from in, in being able to apply LLA and take this forward. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to you, Alpha, for the next three minutes. Uh, if we do have a little time after you and Helen go, then we will take any additional nuggets from the floor. So uh, over to you, Alpha. Thanks so much, Josh. Thanks so much, everyone. Yes, indeed, the breakout sessions were really, really engaging and uh, interesting. So a few things. One is on issues of financing to local solutions. I think one of the key things that came out very clearly is the need for donors and grassroots communities to co-create some of these processes, to sit down together and actually design some of these uh, funding mechanisms and design some of these proposals. And a good example that came out was uh, FCDO is working with the, Nepal, the Nepalese government and they have quite an interesting co-creation process which can actually be scaled up to other countries. So that's one. Then number two is on the flexibility of mechanisms. I think uh, what the grassroots community is talking about is that, yes, we uh, would like to have access to this financing, but then the stringent measures of reporting and accounting and all that are really, really uh, putting them away from that kind of uh, accessibility. So a quick one is to look at how can uh, donors be able to uh, kind of relax their, their stringent measures to at least accommodate some of these grassroots communities. Then the third one was on the issue of language. I think when talking to grassroots communities is, I think this came from SDI and Sarah as well, is a lot of times we, we we are very technical in talking about some of these things to communities, which they really don't understand. And that uh, kind of puts a barrier to, to what extent can they actually be engaged? So are we able to demystify some of these concepts? Are we able to break them down to a simpler language to something that is actually much more uh, understood by communities? Then uh, there's one very interesting uh, submission from Vincent from FCDO is that really donors need to stop looking at every uh, every problem with the same kind of solution. It's it's never homogeneous. So it's it can't be a one size fits all kind of piece of cloth. I think it's important to, and this goes back to the co-creation part. I think it's important for donors to approach every situation or every kind of uh, project they're working on as different and trying to listen more to communities, try to co-create with them what this could actually look like for them. Then a few last ones is uh, there is something from SDI. We need to have more structured voices of local communities, not only being recognized in international conferences and international workshops, but actually going back to the local communities and actually being able to recognize things like local knowledge, local expertise, that communities actually have their own way of doing things. And can we actually be appreciative of that fact and actually support that process much more? as donors, as, 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 uh, as global actors in this field. Then the last one is, I think this came from 
what I start from, uh, I think from working in a youth movement that is very new that actually formed 2021. Can we provide more opportunities for young people to actually network, to actually uh, be able to reach out to some of these donors, but also how can donors portray that trust to, to them even before they become big and they're able to trust them that indeed if we finance you, then you're able to actually do some of these things. So thank you, uh, thank you for that. And uh, the last one is donors need to have a more reflecting process rather than being too concerned about just reporting accounting and financial reporting. So can we reflect a bit more on other things as well? Thanks so much. Uh, fantastic, Alpha. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Helen, I'm going to hand over to you, but I'm also going to ask you uh, once you've kind of dovetailed and added um, any additional points that came out from our group to just segue straight into uh, concluding with the way forward and capturing some practical actions going forward. Over to you, Helen. Fantastic. Thanks, Josh. And excuse me, I just want to, to build on what Alpha said. I think it sounds like we also had a very rich discussion which raised very similar issues. Um, so I'm not going to repeat them all. I think um, a couple that I would, would reiterate were around flexibility of guidelines. So there was a question about whether uh, providers, for example, could look at where there was more flexibility in some of their processes and procedures that could help respond to the differing needs of different groups. Um, this message about co-creation of, um, of uh, pr uh, proposals came through front and centre. Um, but also, I think there were some, some important issues around improving transparency. It came back to this question about, you know, we must, we must continue to work with donors and providers to improve the transparency so that communities can see, people can see where the, the finance is coming and understand that there is finance available out there. Um, that came through very clearly, as did a question about capacity of local organisations and, and a sense of, what role is there for both intermediaries and providers to support fundamental capacity building so that the argument that local communities don't or local organizations don't have capacity is not something that can continue to be uh, to be rolled out. Um, uh, one or two additional points that I think um, were raised were around recognition of core costs. Uh, there was some uh, examples, I think it was from South Africa, Africa from some of the work looking at uh, EDA, but also the experience there around actually how much time it can take for intermediaries and grassroots organizations in particular to get behind and kind of do that work around proposals, but also governments as well at different levels, local government. And so what solution is there to support core costs for organizations to enable the sustainability of some of these uh, organizations to um, to maintain themselves so it becomes less about project based finance, but it kind of feeds into this longer term uh, sustainability. And then finally, we had a suggestion about whether we should have targets, whether donors might want to have targets for delivery channels. So to kind of encourage them to think about that, that channel, that downward accountability, that I think Ebony uh, referred to it as in terms of really being able to demonstrate how they are taking forward um, locally led adaptation throughout their entire supply chain, as it were. Um, I'm conscious we had a really rich debate. I have not managed to capture all the points that people made. Um, and I think there was still a little bit more work perhaps that we could have got into to really focus on what of all those ideas could be prioritized in the next 12 months. Um, so I think what we would, um, in terms of next steps, I think what would be great is we'll try and obviously pull together some of the, the results of your um, deliberations um, and put out there a kind of set of initial, oh, excuse me, uh, priorities that people will, that people at different stakeholder groups uh, might be looking at. We will be trying to feed in some of the, the findings, the high level messages from this discussion into upcoming uh, opportunities in the build up to COP and encourage people to also use their um, events and their um, interactions with providers, with um, intermediaries to continue to raise uh, the, the importance of putting LLA front and center of the work that we are doing. Um, we hope that at COP there will be some discussion where we can hear from providers, intermediaries, um, grassroots organizations together 
about how you know the momentum we can keep the momentum going and obviously we really welcome the opportunity of having the community of practice under the cba to hear your voices and your views and we'll build on that with um other organizations over the coming weeks to see if we can refine a set of of actions so oh excuse me <coughs> sorry um so with no without sort of wanting to bring you on i don't know whether anybody who has not had a chance to just raise a reflection would like to add anything from one of the groups that was not heard i don't want to give anyone a i know there was a lot of discussion in the groups so i don't know whether anyone wants to just raise anything that you feel was discussed in your breakout group which has not been captured No, um, no. He he Helen, while we're looking um, for hands or waiting for people to reflect some more, there is a, a point that was made by Vincent in the chat around um, donors and working directly with communities, uh, saying that that's probably not a good idea because of the important role that national and sub-national uh, authorities play and whose responsibility it is. And I think this goes back to, to the discussion, uh, to our discussion, where somebody pointed out the importance of linking climate change to the normal development planning a trajectory that exists in country which is implemented at national and sub-national level so the importance of those actors uh in keeping uh, in, in that whole process and making sure that they're a part of it even though focus is on community so i just thought i'd, I'd bring that up uh because it, it it appeared in the chat yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Yes, I will admit to uh, struggling with following the chat and um, <laughs> and trying to put you you're doing an excellent job there. But I think that's exactly one of the points that people made was around that kind of core development uh, focus and the core roles of the systems and the institutions um, and how the climate um, adaptation work uh, can you know be part of that and not seen as you know completely and utterly separate. Um, I'm very conscious we've only got a couple of minutes left. There's still more chats coming through. As I say, we'll pull together a summary of the the headline messages, but in particular. Um, the readouts from the different breakout groups we will use to try and think through and refine a potential set of focus areas for the community of practice for different organizations to consider and further discuss in terms of narrowing down hopefully a, a set of areas that we can all coalesce around over the next 12 months to to further build uh, momentum on LLA. So I would say thank you to everybody for your participation today. Um, thank you to Josh, thank you to all our speakers for your contributions and thank you of course to everybody in the uh, all the participants as well for your um, for your excellent thoughts and um, reflections. Thank you very much.